Hello, everyone. My name is James W. Gesso, and this is Podcasting on Salvia. Obviously, I'm kidding. Besides that being entirely uncharacteristic of this show, YouTube would give me a proper spanking if I consumed any substance directly on video. That, that's that's a big no-no, so I'm, I'm not going to do that because, well, of course, I don't want to piss YouTube off. I'm already contentious enough as a, as a drug YouTuber. But... Today's show is about salvia, um, in fact, very in-depth about salvia, uh, featuring Christopher Solomon. Incorporating lessons learned from salvia as a student of somatic psychotherapy, Christopher is pioneering techniques to use salvia as a therapeutic tool for guided self-healing, meditation, and introspection. Christopher lectures about the proper, intentional, and therapeutic use of salvia, offering a blend of scientific, esoteric, and therapeutic perspectives. He also cultivates a medicinal salvia garden for use in his therapeutic practice with clients. Christopher was a recent participant in the John Hopkins University study about the effects of salvinorin A on human brain activity and connectivity using fMRI methods. He has lectured with a variety of organizations in the Bay Area, including ERI, the Entheogenic Research Integration and Education Organization. Uh, he received his holistic health coaching certification from the Institute of Integrative, I didn't pronounce that right, uh, Nutrition, and currently studies somatic psychotherapy at the Hakomi Institute in Berkeley, California, and I am very happy to have him on the show for you today. We have a wonderfully in-depth conversation about salvia, ranging from general historical stuff to pharmacology to sort of the topography of salvia space to levels of intensity, as well as a, essentially what salvia therapy looks like and the varieties of um, possibilities that the therapy offers, as well as general advice for navigating the space or in supporting others in the space in both positive and not so positive experiences. Some quick tech uh, comments. The bandwidth between Christopher and I was poor, uh, and the conversation dropped out a few times, some of which I left in um, to sort of like contextualize the the real-time dynamics of the rapport, but some of which I cut out because it was just unnecessary. Um, but just letting you know that there are a few moments where it cuts out and we say some things, and uh, that is an intentional, uh, you know, intentionally left in, and hopefully it does, like I said, um, sort of deepen the, the con context of, uh, of the rapport that we were sharing that day. So yeah, I really hope you enjoy this episode. Of course, this episode was brought to you uh, by my patrons on Patreon, who I'm super stoked <laughs> continue to help me make it. So huge thank you to those patrons, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen right now or in the show notes to this episode uh, on jameswgesso.com or wherever you are catching this podcast. And I would love it if you would become a patron if you're not already. Uh, it's a really fantastic way to get into a circle of reciprocity with me as you can t you continue to enjoy the content and I continue to put energy and efforts and investment into making this content for you, but also because I love it, of course. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso or going to jameswgesso.com forward slash support where you can learn not only about jumping over to the Patreon page, but other ways that you could support the show, including PayPal, or crypto, big thanks to Donnie for that recent Litecoin donation. Or you could buy some things like some limited edition blotter art, which I still have about 35 of, and I would love for you to buy some because they're just collecting dust here, and I think they're amazing, and I think you're gonna like putting it up on your wall or you know doing whatever you wanna do with that blotter art. Uh, alternatively, you can purchase one of my lectures, one of my books, or even a t-shirt, like the one I'm wearing in this video on YouTube. Those are the ways you could support. I would love it if you did. Alternatively, just subscribe to the show, give it a like wherever you found it, and uh, engage in the discourse on the subreddit R at Mind Podcast. So support or engage, <laughs> one or the other, both of which would make me very, very happy. So thanks. All right, enough of that. Into this episode with Christopher Solomon here on Adventures Through the Mind. Enjoy. All right. Uh, okay, just going to drink some mate and then... Take your time. Enjoy. Ah. 
Christopher Solomon, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. <laughs> so funny, the exact moment that I said that to you, we just had a massive lag and everything froze. We had a lag. Oh my it? God. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You can say that again. All right. Well, well, you know what? I might just include all of that. Uh, <laughs> so you can just respond as though you just heard the question. <laughs> well, yeah. As And it's... The uh, truth is still there. That is good to be here. Okay, great. Good to hear, man. Yeah, thanks um, for having me on your show. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a cool sort of um, we'll say you know, synchronistic is not the right word, but it was interesting because I had read about your presentation um, in the in the program for the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, and yeah. um, but it was it was it was like a a micro lecture during the lunch break. And I, mm -hmm. I actually almost missed the entire thing because I was just so oh. consumed in my lunch break. And I'm like, oh, right. oh dang. <laughs> so I ran down. Yeah. I'm really glad that I did. Cause, um, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was very interesting. Okay. Well, let's um, send a little... <laughs> I mean this. I mean this somewhat playfully, but like, let's send a little, uh, you know, a uh, prayer to the to the Wi-Fi gods that, yes. that we are. Our bandwidth is solid. Hi. Please keep our bandwidth solid <laughs> and our upload and download speed strong. Okay. So, um, Amen. And let's let's <laughs> take it from the top. Christopher Solomon, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Uh, so I felt like my intro was really good just before, but I'll try to like reiterate it again. The listeners here might be familiar with Salvia, um, either directly familiar or, um, indirectly familiar through the on Salvia video series, such as the gardening on Salvia, which is, I mean, admittedly, I think it's a pretty hilarious video. Um, <laughs> uh, but, or, or, you know, videos of Miley Cyrus or generally people of maybe smoking Salvia on YouTube and freaking out. Um, right. So just how not to do it. Yes, <laughs> we'll we'll get there. But thank you for that important bam right in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, start us off assuming we know absolutely nothing. You know what is salvia? Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? What does it do? And how does it work? Okay. Yes. Very good questions. All of them. So um, salvia divinorum. It's a species of um, mint from the Labiate family, and there is over five hundred different types of salvia. But there's this one particular type of salvia, which is salvia divinorum, that is used indigenously by shamans in Oaxaca, Mexico, and they use it specifically for the case of healing and divination. And um, so it's, again, it grows in the Sierra Mazatec mountain regions. There isn't that long of a history of it being used traditionally as a medicine. Um, compare that to another a lot of their other plants that have been used for a lot longer. Um, and also, how does it work? It's um, well, it works by on the scientific level. It works by it works by activating your kappa opioid receptors in your brain. Um, there's three opioid receptors in the brain. There's kappa, delta, and mu. And salvia divinorum specifically activates the kappa opioid receptors. And I can talk more later about the difference between all those, but I'm not going to jump into that straight at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and the effects are very different depending on how it's administered and depending on the dose. So it can, the effects can range from light body tingle sensation all the way to having a very profound and strong dissociative experience where you lose your identity and track of time and space and everything. And then there's a lot of levels in between where um, the effects are quite different depending on how you take it and how much you take it. Hmm. So there was, there's a piece there that had been mentioned before we had all the bandwidth issues that uh, I'd like you to expand on a little bit, which is that um, that the actual, this, this species of plant, the salvia divinorum, is, a, mm -hmm. is an anomaly in some way. Right, right. So it's an anomaly because the um, the presence of it is a kind of a widespread mystery because it is all over the mountain ranges in the Sierra Mazatec in Oaxaca. And the funny thing about salvia is that less than 2% of its seeds are viable. Mm. So the only way that salvia can be propagated is if you take a cutting, you root it. You can The best way to do it is you, if you take a cutting from a mother plant, you take a cutting, you root it in water, wait for the roots to sprout, and then plant it. Or alternatively, you can take a cutting and just stick it straight in the ground and then root it in that way and make the clones of it that way. 
But that means that in order for salvia to have gotten all over the mountain ranges there, people or someone or a group of people had to have spread salvia themselves. It couldn't have spread itself as far and wide as it did. Hmm. And there's absolutely no local shamans know the history of who, who did this. Another interesting thing is they have no indigenous name for salvia. Hmm. They refer to her as Scar Maria Pastora. They think of her as the embodiment of the Virgin Mary. Um, or they think of her as like a shepherdess. But if you take San Pedro, for example, San Pedro wasn't always called San Pedro. Its indigenous name is Wachuma. Mm-hmm. But Salvia Divinorum, there's no indigenous name for it. And since the only connection they have with it is to the Virgin Mary, it means that their understanding and discovery and use of Salvia only started after the Spaniards had firmly colonialized the entire area and um, made everyone sign up to the idea of Catholicism or the Catholic beliefs. Hmm. And so it is kind of a newcomer on the block because if they'd known about it before the, they'd been colonized, it would have had an indigenous name. Hmm. So it seems that this mystery plant with very alien properties, it's much different than any other plant medicine out there, this plant just seemingly appeared and got spread all over the mountains. And, and again, like you mentioned, there is no hybrid to it or there's no, they haven't found a combination of other plants that it came from. So it's its own thing. Hmm. Now I've heard, I've heard that, um, that one of the, hmm, I'm going to say folklore and somehow I feel like by saying that it might come off as like, as like an ethno, I don't want to come off as ethnocentric, you know, like, you know, that pretend mm. story, but that's mm. not what I mean. But I, I've heard that the folklore is that um, the plant was just manifested into existence as a singular plant and that it, you know, that was part of how it came to be. Have you heard anything mm-hmm. about this or can you comment on it? Uh, yes, I've, I've heard that. Um, whether it's true or not, <laughs> I, I don't really know, but it's, and I'd imagine that that folklore was there because there's been no written history or there's been no oral history of how it came to be passed down. And there's also when botanists and ethnobotanists have studied it, again, they can't really trace where it came from. Mm-hmm. So in this case, I like the fact that that folklore is there because it's confirming what the researchers are finding as well. Mm-hmm. Now, where to cross over into the realm of folklore is to say that some deity or some aliens brought it down. Right, right. Or or it was like uh, thinking about some of the stories I've heard from, uh, you know, like the, the famed stories of the Iowa Scarrows or whatever that would spend all night in, in prayer around or, you know, ceremony of, of, you know, with some sort of something in mind, like to heal a certain disease and that they would you know, come to in the morning and have manifested a seed for a new plant in the world or something like that. And I don't, right. I don't necessarily rest on these as being, you know, accurate descriptions of, of the actuality of how things come into being, but I find these, right. uh, these mythical stories to really help, sure. I guess, like Im- impregnate my, my very secular, often very secular mind with a little bit more of a, you know, magical or poetic slant when I'm, when I'm working with these plants. Right, right. Or it could be, let's say, someone is searching for a seed that's very difficult to find, or they, because essentially what what they're doing is tracking, hmm. and maybe by um, praying and meditating on their intention very strongly, it might get them to a place of um, focused, clear attention, and because of that, they have better um, foraging and tracking skills to where they can find the seed. If, if they hadn't maybe been in such a meditative um, state to get them clear-headed, they might not have found it. I'm just that's thinking. no, that's an excellent bridge into the rational world. But let's 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 <laughs> let's uh, let's not stay too far on that on that particular tangent. Um, mm-hmm. I would like you, I mean, ever so ever so briefly, but concisely, um, mm. to talk about what you meant when you when you said that it's an it activates the opioid receptors. Now, again, a lot of my yeah. listeners here are actually like pretty competent when it comes to neuropharmacology and and, and, and yeah. insofar as as uh, as these plants and stuff. Um, but speaking as though you know, like from base general knowledge, what what are you talking about there? Right. So, like I mentioned, there's three types of opioid receptors in the brain. There's kappa, delta, and mu opioid receptors. 
And each one of them, when they get agonized or activated, has a different effect on the body. So when people think of opioid receptors, they think, they think oh, opium, they think painkillers. So the mu opioid receptors, that's spelled M-U, the mu opioid receptors get activated when you take things like um, prescription painkillers or alcohol or heroin or morphine or opium. Any of those substances, when you take one of those substances, they activate the mu opioid receptors. So like exclusively and, or or most predominantly? I'm not sure about exclusively or most predominantly. Um I would imagine exclusively, and maybe some of your listeners, listeners who have a better understanding might know, but the reason why I'm thinking that it's um, exclusively is because when the kappa opioid receptors get activated, it's a very distinctive physiological feeling that happens in the body. Hmm. And so when you get your mu opioid receptors activated, what happens is you have that morphine or you have the alcohol, and it's a very pleasurable experience. Mm -hmm. And it, it feels great, and you've, all your worries wash away, and whatever happens. But the problem with that is it creates um, one very rapid tolerance buildup, and secondly, um, addictive qualities and tendencies. And if you use these substances over time, you're likely to lead to states of depression and withdrawal, mm -hmm. because the only thing that feels good is that button being pushed again. Sure. Now, with a kappa opioid receptor system. I will say as well, the kappa opioid receptor system is responsible for regulating a lot of things in the body. Um, okay. Mu opioid receptor system, it's for pain. And kappa opioid re receptor system is also for regulating pain, but it's also uh, responsible for regulating um, our mood. And it's also responsible for regulating our, our motor control and our movements. Hmm. Um, it's also responsible for our inflammatory system and our immune system. And there's a part of the brain called the claustrum, that's C-L-A-U-S-T-R-U-M. And it was uh, Francis Crick's last area of study because it was he believed it to be the, the storehouse of consciousness. Mm. And there's an extremely high density of kappa opioid receptors in uh, the claustrum. So what researchers at Johns Hopkins University are doing right now is they're studying the effects of salvia on the claustrum and the kappa opioid receptors to see what role it has in um, giving us our perception of consciousness, perhaps. Hmm. But now, this is where some of the healing benefits of salvia come into place as well, because when you get those kappa opioid receptors activated, um, it's for many people, there is a way to experience salvia where it does become euphoric and enjoyable and it feels good. It's never going to feel like morphine good. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a way where it doesn't have to be uncomfortable. But when you get the kappa opioid receptors activated, it's generally a little bit of an uncomfortable experience. And the thing that's interesting is after those, ac those receptors are activated and the effects have worn off, then real life and sobriety feel really, really damn good. Hmm. And so there's been a lot of research that they've done where they've shown um, – it's extremely useful for treating depression, anxiety, and opioid addiction. Interesting. And, yeah, and there's research. There's there's a great um, article um, called uh, I think the therapeutic use of terpenes. I think is the name of the article. And th there's a lot of terpenes in salvia. Hmm. Um, it, it's a specific type of terpene called a uh, um, it's a tricyclic diterpenoid. And it's because of the tricyclic diterpenoids in salvia that it has the very profound anti-inflammatory effects. But mm -hmm. something I like about this is the science and the medical studies that they're doing are showing that having your kappa opioid receptors activated is useful for, for treating depression and alcoholism. And that crosses over to how the shamans use it indigenous, indigenously as well. They use it to treat alcoholics as well. And um, they used for healing and inflammation. Hmm, cool. Well, I want to I want to unpack a little bit more about the therapeutic aspects um, later. Although I am yeah. wondering right now, I had read and it's so like unsubstantiated what I'm about to say, but I read an article a while back about the health benefits of saunas. And one of the things that they brought oh. up is that there's a type of opioid activation in the brain when you're in a sauna that basically contributes to pain. 
um, that it's mm. that it causes pain or discomfort in the body. And the consequence when you leave and you're outside of the sauna uh, uh, is that you know the after effects is that pain is relieved and you right. f- your actual inflammation everything goes down so you're being positively impacted by subjugating yourself to a type of opioid that's responsible for the perception of pain right yeah so i wonder if that's, there's a relationship there yeah and I mean, it could be because just putting yourself in uncomfortable situations in life sometimes makes you stronger and more able to handle more adverse situations as they arise in the future hmm. so um another thing that i was going to say is um the kappa opioid receptor system is responsible because you mentioned pain it's responsible for nociception or the regulation of pain mm-hmm. and one so something researchers are trying to do is they're trying to make um analgesics uh, painkillers by activating the kappa opioid receptor system instead of the mu opioid receptor system. So they're looking at the salvia as well to see if they can understand how it affects us to where they can make some um, drug delivery system for pain that doesn't lead to massive addiction and death. Right, right. So the the main alkaloid in, in salvia is salvinorum A, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, and it's also uh, you know last last I did some research on this particular uh, plant or this molecule, it was the most targeted activator or agonist of kappa opioid receptors that are known. That it basically exclusively activates this one receptor site in a way that no other drug or chemical that we know of um, mm-hmm. can do. Is, is that is that still accurate? Yes, that is that's my understanding as well. Yeah, because there are um, there's a few other types of salvia that have that have um, a little bit of salvinorin in it. Um, I'm forgetting the names. It's like salvia splendens or salvia melissodora. It's something like that, and that has a smaller amounts of um, salvinorin A in it. But the salvinorin A and salvinorin B, mm. actually, and salvinorin A is the thing that gives us the effects, and but then. Um, after you smoke salvia or chew it, it gets metabolized into salvinorin B. Hmm. And then once it's in that state, um, then it gets taken out of your system. Salvia doesn't last in the system very long at all. It gets metabolized very quickly. So if there was a drug test for salvia, which there's not, but if there was, you wouldn't be able to find any traces in your system about 30 minutes to an hour after you take it. Hmm, that's very interesting. Um, let's go into modes of consumption because there are a variety of different methods. There's mm-hmm. uh, tinctures, there's quid or, or chewing on the on the raw leaf or mm-hmm. smoking the dried leaf or extracts. Can you just comment on uh, these different routes of administration, you know, dosing for each one, um, how they compare to each other and why one route might be preferable over another? Right. So... First, I'll, I, one thing I will mention about dosing is it's very difficult to give specific dosage instructions for salvia because um, unlike other opio- like um, unlike opioids or other drugs, really, salvia has reverse tolerance effects. Hmm. So you need less of it over time, which is very interesting. Hmm. So that's why I hesitate to say take X amount of salvia, like take this much salvia because If I were to take as much salvia now as I did when I first started using salvia, it would be too much for me. Hmm. So I always compare myself if, um, yeah, if if I were to, when when I introduce new people to salvia, the amount I give them that gives them a mild effect would give me a strong effect. Hmm. Yeah. So dosing is a little bit tricky. But I will say that dosing varies wildly um, depending on whether it's chewed or whether it's smoked or whether you use the tincture. Now, traditionally, it was used by chewing the fresh leaves. And what they would do is they would take um, pairs of leaves. They'd count the leaves off in pairs. And the reason why they'd count the leaves off in pairs is because of their, um, of their belief and practice that everything has a masculine and a feminine energy, a light and a dark. And so when they count off the leaves to use it in the shamanic cer- healing ceremony, they do it in pairs because they think if you do not eat the leaves in pairs, then your your shadow would not meet your light or the yin wouldn't meet the yang or your male and female parts of the plant medicine wouldn't meet each other. Mm. 
So they usually count them off in about 16 pairs to start off, so 32 leaves, but they count them off in 16 pairs. And what they do is they roll them up like a cigar, and um, it's, it's called a quid, Q-U-I-D-D. So there's this quid, and then what you do is you just chew on the fresh leaves, you chew, 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 and hold the leaves in your mouth the entire time. And the reason why is because salvia isn't active if you swallow it. It's only active if you hold the fresh leaves or the dried leaves, but not the extract. Hmm. Um, Let me pause you for a second there because, uh, you know, again, listeners might be familiar with uh, Hamilton's pharmacopoeia, Hamilton Morris from Vice, and he had a an episode that was specifically, you know, he went into the, the Mazatec region in Mexico and he had the salvia and he was eating the leaves, like chewing and swallowing them and still right. seemed to have an effect. What are your, what's your thoughts on what, on what we saw there? Yeah. So I'm glad to bring that up because I remember when I watched that episode, remember the day before he chewed the leaves, they took him to the river mm-hmm. and they made, um, they put some salvia leaves in water and made him drink the water. And when I saw them doing that, I was thinking, why are they doing that? Because he's not even holding the water in his mouth. He's not holding the leaves in his mouth. It's not going to work. And if you'll remember from the episode, it didn't work. He, he right. got no effect from that. Now, when he was chewing it and he was swallowing it, I personally believe there was no need for him to swallow it. But the reason why he was getting the effect is just because he was chewing each leaf for each like bunch for a while. And she gave him a lot of leaves. You know, it was a big old stack of leaves. Sure. And so he would chew, 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 chew and swallow. But as soon as he swallowed it, he was no longer getting any more in his system. Huh. So it had an effect on him because he was just chewing a bunch of fresh new leaves for a long time. Mm. So, yeah, the leaves were in his mouth and making contact with his, um, uh, the buccal, it's buccally absorbed, so the, the membranes in the cheeks. Mm-hmm. So it was making contact with that for a long time. But you needn't chew and swallow a lot of leaves. What you can do is you can have your leaves and you can chew them and just hold them in your mouth for about 15 to 30 minutes. Mm. And then you don't need as many leaves. Now, there is a tincture as well. So a tincture, what, what it is, is just an alcohol extraction of salvia. And you can just put droppers of, um, like dropperfuls of liquid tincture in your mouth and hold that in your mouth for a long time. If I'm going to take salvia orally instead of smoking it, Personally, my favorite way to do it is to do a combination of fresh leaves and tincture. Hmm. And the reason for this is you need less leaves and you need less tincture. And also, because you have the leaves, the tincture in your mouth at the same time as the leaves, um, it doesn't burn your mouth as much because the leaf absorbs the alcohol. Hmm. So you don't get little blisters and things like that. Hmm. It just makes it a lot more of a pleasant experience. Hmm. Now... The way I do that is what I'll do is I'll take two fresh leaves and I'll roll them up and then I'll chew them and put them in my mouth and kind of keep them in the corner of my cheek there. So I'll do two fresh leaves and then two dropperfuls of extract. And then I wait about eight minutes and then I add, while keeping what I've already put in my mouth, I'll eat another two leaves and then add some more extract, wait another eight minutes, and then maybe again, another two leaves, wait another eight minutes. Well, another two leaves, another t- two dropperfuls, wait about eight minutes. And that gives me a, a strong extended salvia experience, and I usually do about three rounds. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering about two things, one of which is like how much leaf matter you have in your mouth by the end of that and whether or not there's a danger yeah. of choking when you start to dissociate into this other, you know, psychedelic reality. Um, That's and, a really and, good question. And and, yeah. and whether or not you spit it out at some point. Yes. Um, so essentially because you're only chewing like between six and eight leaves, um, there's not that much leaf matter in your mouth. What's more in your mouth is just the tincture and the saliva that's been collecting over time. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are concerned about choking, which which is a valid concern, especially if you're doing it and you're lying down on your back, Mm -hmm. 
And then if you start to dissociate because you had a little bit more leaves than you thought you were going to, you, you obviously don't want that to happen. So what you could do is you could chew two leaves and then two, do dropper fulls. Or even if you didn't have dropper fulls, you could chew leaves, let that sit in your mouth for 10 minutes, and then spit them out and just put some more leaves in. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then let that happen and then spit that out and then keep doing that. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good safety advice uh, for not not choking uh, during yeah. during your psychedelic experience. What are the other methods of administration? So there's smoking, uh, which mm-hmm. you had alluded to being your your preferred method, um, and I mean obviously that that's room to comment on the difference between yeah. a dried salvia leaf and like an eighty x salvia punch in the face. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Preferred smoked method, um, or I'd say like the the smoke method is preferred for me, just because of its um, short duration. And during that short duration, um, you can do a lot of work in that time. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of like a it's an effective, quick way of doing it. And then if you go with a clear intention, and you could get a lot of work. But I, I wouldn't say that. Um, if I were to choose chewing fresh leaves over smoking it, I would choose chewing fresh leaves. Hmm. But um, it's difficult to find them. It's very time consuming. It takes quite a few hours. And if you're just getting started into salvia, it might be a little bit too subtle for you. Um, but when working with people with salvia, I, I prefer the, the smoked method as well because you can have a conversation with the person if they need to say anything insightful. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not such a long drawn out experience. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, some, some people, you know, they might know about extracts, other people might not know anything about extracts. So I'll, I'll talk about the difference about, between that. So there's plain salvia leaf where the salvia grows and you cut the leaf off and then you dry it and then you can smoke that. Or there's salvia extract, and I'm sure you've noticed that there's, you know, 5x, 10x, 50x, all the way to, I think the highest it goes is 400x, and and then after that, based on the look on your face, you're like, my God. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, and then after that, I think after 400x, you just get to pure crystalline salvinorin A. So you can keep extracting it to the point where you get salvia crystals. Yeah. And you, if you have pure salvinorin A, you only need about one milligram. Wow. So a really, really, really tiny amount. Um, so it is the most potent naturally occurring hallucinogenic plant that there is. Mm. But the way salvia extract works is there's, um, they'll take a bunch of leaf, dry plain leaf, and they'll set it in acetone and extract all the salvinorin A out of it. And they'll keep doing the extraction to the point where it becomes a crystalline salvia form. And then what they do is they'll take that crystalline salvia form, they'll take however many milligrams and re-dissolve it in acetone. Mm-hmm. And then pour that acetone over a small amount of like plain leaf. Sure. And then let the acetone evaporate and it becomes infused. Right, yeah, let the acetone evaporate. And essentially, it's the equivalent of taking like this much salvia and concentrating it into this much space. Great, yeah. And so that's how salvia extracts work. And, you know, it's great because you only need a little bit of substance to get a strong experience, but that's what also makes it not great because people don't understand that you really need such a little bit of leaf. Um, That's why the most common mistake people make when they're smoking salvia is they'll load, load a big bowl of salvia extract and they'll hit that and they're taking 15 times as much as they should Mm -hmm. so i want i want to get into the consequences of that type of experience um maybe slightly afterwards Mm -hmm. um but i have a i have a short i have a short question maybe it's not a short question depending on how you want to address it Um, and then i want to get in a little bit deeper into salvia therapy Um, the short question is about microdosing and when you said that there's a reverse tolerance with salvia, um, my immediate inclination was like, well, microdosing might not last for very long then. Um, but do you have any experience mm-hmm. or knowledge regarding mm-hmm. microdosing salvia? Um, say that last part of the section again, you lagged. Uh, yes. So I was, 
Uh, you heard me say the bit about the reverse tolerance. My microdosing tolerance wouldn't and... last very long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do you have any experience or knowledge uh, regarding microdosing, Salvia? I do. Um, I say it's microdosing the same way that we microdose mushrooms or, um, yeah, like, because people are microdosing LSD and they're microdosing mushrooms and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um what they're doing is they're microdosing these other psychedelics and then they're going about their day as normal. Mm -hmm. But with salvia, I would call a microdose nothing more than a very, very small hit. Hmm. But I wouldn't microdose salvia and then immediately go on about my day. I would make, I would incorporate it into my meditation session. Hmm. So microdosing might not be the, I mean, it, it would be a microdose, but let's say you have um, a scale of salvia experience from like zero to 10 and zero being you've taken no salvia and 10 being you've taken a lot of salvia and you've become pure consciousness. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, a microdose would be like a level one or level two. Mm. But I would still treat the process of microdosing with salvia. I would still treat the yeah the process of going to level one as I would treat the process of going to level five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, hmm. and that would be meditating in silence, in darkness, in stillness. Hmm. Yeah. I actually had a friend of mine when I first started getting into salvia. This friend of mine, um, he had told me that he just decided one day to explore it, and he spent I can't remember how long he said, but some really long period of time where every morning he had just single leaf, like single extract dry mm. leaf, uh, or non-extracted dry leaf, I guess. And he would roll a joint with it, like as in just just salvia leaf. Yeah. And he would sit down and he would smoke it silently. Mm -hmm. And then when the effects wore off, he would just go about his day. And he, he, he had said that it was one of the most meaningful experiences he had in his life was this extended period of time of doing this yeah. every single day that I can't yeah. remember the full details because this is, I mean, we're, I'm pushing on a decade since I heard this story. <laughs> um, but, uh, but he had mentioned that he, he had come into that deeply depressed and just mm -hmm. struggling and confused and disoriented in his life. And he had come out of that time yeah. um, feeling competent and confident. And, you know, there could yeah. have been a lot of factors there. Um, but that mm -hmm. was when I first... That's when I first got into hearing about salvia beyond the, you know, beyond the big trip freak outs right. that were on YouTube. Um, yeah, and, and, that, yeah. and that kind of leans in to, I, I mean, it feels like it leans in really nicely into salvia therapy, which is, I, I, this is something that you are sort of the main person behind, right? You're, you're like the only person or one of the few people who have developed this therapeutic approach. Is that is that true? As as far as I know. <laughs> okay, at, at least I, I, at least in the Western world or the Western right, uh, medical Right, right, right. At least in the Western world, I, I haven't met any other salvia therapists. So, now, I, I've met a few people who, I've met one of the person who uses salvia occasionally with one of his clients. He's a therapist, and when he's concerned that she's suicidal and he's really concerned about it, and she's going beyond su suicidal ideation, um, then he does... Uh, gives her salvia and it completely arrests the depression in its tracks. Wow, that is cool. Sort of like uh, similar to what's to the result of a of a ketamine infusion. Exactly, exactly, just like that. Yeah. So he he uses it like that, but he's the only other person that I've heard that uses it like that with a client in a you know in a professional therapeutic manner. But he's not doing guided salvia sessions, or he's not making the entire session about salvia. Right, he's just letting that person have like a big experience holding the space and then something right. along those lines. It's right. funny because now these, it's like, you know, psychedelics for emergency medicine is a pretty, uh, is a pretty interesting, uh, is, is an interesting, um, you know, flip to the stigma, right? Yeah. That mm -hmm. Psychedelics cause a need for emergency medicine, right? You know, but yeah. it's actually the yeah. other way around. Yeah. Quick, get this last amount of LSD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stat. Um, all right, so <laughs> that's just the scene in my head is really funny right now. Uh, so, so what is what is salvia therapy? You alluded to it earlier. You talked a little bit about it, but like, give us give us your key spiel uh, spiel on this. Yeah. 
what what is what is salvia therapy? You know, what are you doing with them, uh, with mm-hmm. these people, and w- what do you propose it offers? Like, what's it beneficial for treating? Right. So, I'll start with what it offers because it offers a broad range of things, and based on the broad range of things that it offers, that can be tailored to the individual and what they're needing in their life right then. Mm-hmm. So, starting with the physiological aspect. It's very useful for um, inflammation and pain. I was mentioning earlier on because, and arthritis as well, I was mentioning earlier on that because of the tricyclic diterpenes in it, it, that's what gives it its strong anti-inflammatory properties. Mm -hmm. So there are some people that I use it with that just have aches and pains and they want their aches and pains to go away. Mm -hmm. Now, in conjunction with using it for aches and pains, salvia is an extremely informative body worker. Mm. Um, it's, it actually wasn't too long ago that I came to this discovery. I don't know if other people have, but, um, I just found out about it that, um, movement and body work on light doses of salvia and stretching on light doses of salvia is absolutely incredible Mm. and really lets you stretch very, very deeply. A, A concrete example is, um, I hurt my right shoulder, uh, while rock climbing. Mm hmm. And it just, it was sore for a long time. And I was doing all these shoulder stretches and I was like, you know, doing all these things. And I thought it was maybe related to my back or something. So I was stretching my back because in my mind, I was just thinking about everywhere that my shoulder is connected to. And I was stretching all the other surrounding areas as well. But I was mainly focusing on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And it was sore for months and it just didn't go away. And I thought, okay, well, let's see if Salvia can help out. So I smoked some salvia, and again, I went into it with the intention of, hey, can I get some guidance about my shoulder? Can you, can, but I didn't, the way I phrased it was, you know, you know, can you send your, you know, healing anti-inflammatory properties to my shoulder? Because since stretching wasn't fixing it, I thought it was just inflammation in the shoulder. And so I smoked the salvia, and what the salvia actually told me to do and when salvia tells you to do something, it's more like your own thoughts, mm-hmm. but they're, they're your own thoughts that get a lot louder and clearer and directive and instructive. Hmm. And so what um, I found out is that what I, I picked up my arm and she made me like stretch out my arm like this and cock my wrist back and open my, open my fingers like this. And... Yeah, so it was like this, and, and actually I did it this way. I was just doing it for the camera. So right, right. she made me put my arm out like this, which is straight wrist. straight out from the body. Um, straight out, face, straight out from the body, the, the anterior direction, not laterally, or right. what? Right, laterally, like out to the laterally side, laterally, like this. Yeah, right. And so it was stick yeah. my body out like this, and then open my hands like this, and so. I did that. I'm trying to then, describe it audi- audibly. So like stretching out your fingers wide and, and, and tilting your wrist upwards 90 degrees so that your fingers are pointing towards the ceiling. Exactly. And so she, she just had me do that. And she said, you know, do that, open your hands like that. And as soon as I did that, I felt these um, extreme stretching and tension all the way up from my wrist to my elbow. Hmm. And that stretched out and then I felt my shoulder go flick and it like opened a little bit and Mm. my shoulder got some relief in a stretch Mm. and that's what I mean by oh and so since then that's what I mean by Salvia being an informative body worker she let me know hey this your shoulder injury isn't coming from tightness or inflammation in your shoulder your shoulder injury is actually coming from tightness in your forearms Hmm. and tightness in your hands, which makes sense because I was rock climbing right, and I right. wasn't stretching that part of my body correctly. And um, so that's one thing I like about salvia is when you work with salvia, you you have to be um, actively engaged with the plant. Hmm. You can't just sit back and let her do all the work. She wants you to get involved in somehow. Um, anyway, that was a little bit of a tangent on how salvia helped me recently. This was just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Well, actually, um, I, I'm going to like just stop here and say I appreciate that because I have, I, I'm in a really good place right now, but I have had 
multiple anterior shoulder shoulder subluxations my entire life, Mm -hmm. like for the last 10 years. I mean, I'm at the longest amount of time without a re-injury. So what you just did was offer me some advice (laughs) on how to, you know, further keep my shoulder healthy. So, and possibly the listeners. So uh, I appreciate that personally. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Good, good. Glad it could help. Um, And so you get information about how your body should best be moved and stretched. But then also, because salvia has such um, interesting physiological tactile sensations as well, when you have a low dose of salvia and you move your body and stretch your body on salvia, the stretches go a lot deeper. Hmm. If you do, um, you know, I'm thinking like salvia yoga is one, I like the way that sounds. This <laughs> sounds like salvia yoga. Um, but if I do a, a light dose of salvia, and again, you can only do these on sort of light doses, but if you do a light dose of salvia and just do some yoga movements, your movements are a lot more in line because you have a different sense of how your body is put together and how it's stacking itself. Hmm. So so physically, salvia and body work goes very well together um, if you do it correctly. Um, also because of the anti-inflammatory effects, it, it, it's useful for that. Um, also they've done EEGs on people when they smoke salvia and it, um, creates a very high, um, oscillation of your theta brain waves when you smoke salvia. Hmm. And there's a lot of benefit of about be, becoming relaxed and mindful and clear and being in the theta brainwave state can be very healing as well. Mm-hmm. And so even if you don't take an active engaging role while you're go- undergoing your salvia session, just being put in a place of quiet contemplative stillness with your theta brainwaves has beneficial aspects as well. I think that's where some of its antidepressive qualities come from. Now, there's also um, another reason people want to do it is because they want to understand themselves. They want to come to a deeper understanding of their own psyche, of their own consciousness. And they, they want to understand their own identity a little bit better and how they fit into the world and how they feel the world does or doesn't fit around them and how to make those two things come into alignment. And salvia can be very useful for that because what you do is when you smoke salvia mindfully and with intention, it quiets the the chitter chatter monkey brain of yours that's always talking. And when once you come to a place of quiet stillness, what happens is the important thoughts are left over. Hmm. So um, I, when I do salvia with people or when I do it myself and they have an intention, it's very, very good for problem solving. If you yeah. actually have a question, even if it's one of a ethical dilemma, it can be an ethical dilemma or it could be something pragmatic like, you know, which person do I hire for my next company? I, I had someone I was working with, he didn't know whether he should hire a male or a female in this next like top leadership role in his company. And so he posed that question to Salvia and he was humming and hawing and going back and forth and his mind was making lists of pros and cons. And we, we always do that. We make lists of pros and cons all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that makes us difficult to get any to any sort of clarity because sure. it keeps things always a little bit muddy. Like, well, yeah. it could be this and it could be this. Um, but with Salvia, that list of pros and cons list gets totally taken away. And it's like, this is what you do. Hmm. Like... I know you know that you know what you need to do, so this is what you need to do. You know, that's Salvia speaking. She, she was just like, cut all the bullshit, cut all these extraneous little things going on around, and let's just get straight to it. She's very direct and very pragmatic. I mean, it, one of the one of the um, colloquial, ooh, I always say that word wrong, uh, names for, for Salvia is Diviner Sage, is it not? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly, mm. yeah. And so, and, so, and, and, and that, that sort of came out in a very like personal explorational stuff. Um, and so can you comment on where that fits into say, you know, and maybe you have more benefits you want to talk about before getting into therapy, but I'm just curious where your role is when you're, when you're u- utilizing salvia for these benefits, of course, you know, talk about more benefits if that's the flow that you're on, but I'm just curious, mm-hmm. you know, like this sounds like something that you could just do on your own, but as, as a therapist providing therapy, you know, that's right. what is what is your role in, in something like that? 
Right. So my role is there's a few fold. One is just making sure that the person is safe and that they feel held and cared for in that space. Um, the safety aspect is, um, so safety can come in two forms. One is it's gradually giving them the correct dose of salvia because if they're a newbie and they've never had salvia, they don't know how much to take. So they take too big of a strong dose and then they have a dissociative experience and then they stand up and they start walking around and you know well as a setter because i'm there i don't give them too high of a dose because i i'm, I'm dosing them gradually and correctly over time but i make sure that they don't stand get up and start walking around and bump into anything so if they do feel the urge to get up and they want to move around that's fine with me but i just make sure that they don't bump into a bookshelf or anything like that mm -hmm. and um, another thing as well is when people are first getting into salvia, they don't really know how much they should take. And so part of my role as well, at least the first two sessions, is helping them figure out the right dosage for them. And that, that can be profound because it only takes two, like it only takes a marginal amount of a strong dose um, to have the experience become too much. Mm -hmm. And so I'm there to keep them safe. Also, if they get to a stage where they get um, scared, like psychologically scared, and they think they're going to be, they think salvia reality is going to be their new reality, I'm there to make sure that um, I reassure them and I let them know that they've smoked salvia and that it's going to be over soon. But how to take care of someone when they smoke salvia. So I take care of them there by helping them determine dosage, making sure that they're physically safe and make, holding a safe container for them. Hmm. Another thing that I do is if, if they want to, to speak during salvia, they can. And the reason why um, I sometimes encourage speaking is because there's a uh, amnesiac quality to salvia. You can, you can forget what happens very quickly. So I'm there to be able to listen to what they say, remember what they say, and then sometimes guiding slash interpreting side of salvia. So I will be able to ask that if they'll say something specific that doesn't really seem too clear. And there's a few things. If, if they say something and it doesn't mean anything to me, but it, I can tell based on their facial expression, that it means something to them, I will, you know, I can just let that go because it's I'm not, it's not me who needs clarity in what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But sometimes some they'll say something and they'll say it with a con either a confused tone in their voice. Um, it'll be something like, I don't understand, or they or, or they'll even say something that's not as. Um, uh, it's slightly more cryptic, but there'll be a look of confusion in their face. And then I can interject and even just saying something like, what don't you understand? Um, or repeating what they've said to them in a confused manner and help them get some more clarity on, about what they're not understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where almost like reflecting the question back, right? Reflecting the question back. Um, but again, it's it's done with, I, I track the entire body as well, because, um, you know, in my bio, I'm also a student of somatic psychotherapy, and in somatic therapy, what the person saying to you, as well as the words. And um, so, can you, re can you repeat that? Because you, you cut out, you know, in somatic uh, therapy. Oh, yeah. In somatic therapy, um, you track the body, you, you track what their body is saying to you as well as their words. So you don't just listen to what they're saying to you, you listen to how they're saying it to you, but then you also look at what their body positioning is saying, whether it's tension held in a specific place, whether it's shifting from one position to another, all these things are tracked during the session. Mm -hmm. And you have to take the entire thing into account to actually get a real understanding for what the person is going through and what they mean. Mm. And so if you know, it, you can't just make a simple rule like, oh, when they ask a question in Salvia, repeat the question to them, or when they say something, say this. There's, there's no hard and fast rules. 
you have to take the entire experience and what their whole body is saying to you. And you also have to get, like, when you're working with someone one-on-one -on -one like this, you get into a state of limbic resonance with them. And you get to a state of mindfulness to where you can begin to more strongly and empathetically connect with them. And it's that it's that understanding that you get and that connection that you have with someone when you when I'm guiding them through a session that can really help the session unfold in a way that it wouldn't if you were just going by regular rules or going by a script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, that, that, that sounds pretty uh, familiar to me insofar as just somatic psychotherapy in general seems to focus more on building that um, sort of that attunement with like the exactly. large, the larger context of what's happening rather than just the words being said or the techniques that are typically employed um, by the right. therapist and, and beyond, beyond a cognitive centered approach. Is, is there any other, um, is there any other benefits? Because we, we've talked about some of the self guided benefits, stretching, you know, body worker clarity. Uh, you know, and then you talked about, uh, you know, being able to tap in on something, what's going on inside of the self and asking questions, quieting the mind. Uh, and then, you know, you're talking about how you guide the session, but you know, what about the regimen here? So depending mm -hmm. on, you know, and, and, you know, list off benefits as, as they're needed, you know, in the therapy or, or where the therapy could help as needed. But what are you doing here? Is it always, okay, someone comes in and the goal here is to get them to a place where they have a big, a big session, a big, you know, whatever. Uh, right. Or right. is it like, no, I support them in smaller doses over time. Um, or is it like come in once a week for a big dose? Like what are the different sort of like regimens that might be employed? Um, and why might those regimens be employed insofar right. as the person's needs? Right, right. That's, that's an excellent question. So the, the first goal that I have in mind is to introduce the person to Salvia and also introduce Salvia to the person. Because I liked, the way I like to think about it is the same way that you're experiencing salvia, salvia is also experiencing you. Hmm. Now, the interesting thing about this plant is the, the journeys are generally progressive. So the next one leaves, picks up where the previous one ended. And so it's a combination of helping the person learn how to create a relationship with the plant. And salvia often brings to their attention what needs to be worked on. Hmm. Now, I find that <clears throat> uh, most of the healing therapeutic benefits come from salvia in the mid-dose range. I find that when people have extremely strong dissociative experiences, like from level like 7, 8, 9, 10, um, it's a lot more difficult to integrate. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because you forget it very quickly. It fades very rapidly like a dream. And so while those experiences are big and profound and you're like, oh my gosh, and they shake you to your core, uh, that can be helpful to like shake someone out of a rut sometimes. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you just need that big psychic shift to happen. Mm -hmm. But it's not as, um, it's not my preferred way of working personally because I think there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more benefit to, that can be gained in the subtle spaces and the subtle realms. Hmm. Um, that's, you know, people have very strong, I've spoken to a lot of people who've done 5-MeO-DMT, and in my personal 5-MeO-DMT experiences, it's extremely profound and extremely strong. But then you come back and you're like, wow, that was really intense, and I don't really know what happened. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really glean any insights or lessons from that. Hmm. That's it's a very common thing that I hear from people who have both strong salvia experiences and both extremely strong five meo DMT experiences. Interesting. I know that um, in the sort of in the five world, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of different camps. Uh, you know, one camp would be, you know, like basically it's easy to understand. I am God. That's exactly that's it, right. you know, and then right, and, and then you might end up getting into guys like you know Mar Martin Ball, who I, I really respect a lot of his work, um, in in what you do with that. But then there are other people who you know suggest that you know that is a dangerous state to get into. That there's a strong possibility that you know these huge 
like acute experiences leave people in a confused, depersonalized state that that yeah. question, the integration that comes afterwards is not exactly. properly supported and it can exactly. lead to damaging that person psychologically. Now, other people might suggest that that's, you know, initiating an important psycho-spiritual crisis to right. our psyche, the further, you know, uh, cultivation of resilience and maturity in the person, you know, right. but other people might say it's just fundamentally a dangerous thing to do. Um, yeah. So, and, and you're suggesting that it's, you know, there's a similar consequence with a very large acute dose of, uh, of salvia. That can be true for any large dose of any psychedelic. Anything that has a dramatically profound conscious shifting, earth shattering, ego dissolving um, uh, effect like that will leave one shaken up. Mm. Um, I felt that after my very strong 5-MeO experience and after my first very strong salvia experience, the 5-MeO left me more um, unsure and rattled. Mm -hmm. um, after my, and a little bit uh, on shaky ground. Um, one thing I will say is that I found personally that salvia is very, very good at helping one integrate previous difficult psychedelic experience that is exactly what i was going to ask you like did did salvia help you come back from your 5-meo dmt experience yes definitely wow definitely very cool yeah, yeah. um because there's something about um a salvia experience that makes you feel much more connected to the source within yourself versus the source that's out there hmm. i found when i had a 5-meo dmt experience it was like from zero to 100 instantly, boom, complete whiteout. And then, and then when I, and then, you know, you had the realization, oh, I am God. Right. But then you get rocketed back into your body. And there wasn't, it's as if the reality around me was still like moving too much. And um, it just kind of left everything feeling like a little bit off kilter. Mm -hmm. Um. But then I've noticed when, when I've had strong salvia experiences, it will, you know, take me to that big expansive place. It's a different place in 5MEO, a completely different land, different landscape. Um, but then when I come back, I feel as though I'm coming back to myself because instead of exploding outwards only, it's kind of like I exploded deeper within and out. But that going in component was there as well. Mm. Now, that is not to say that someone couldn't have a very, I have heard of stories of people who have had, they've smoked too, too much extract and it left them as rattled as if they would have had a, a strong DMT experience. Mm -hmm. So th there's no hard and fast rules about these things. Mm -hmm. I'm but, noticing, uh, oh, oh, please say what you're going to say. Oh, I'm just noting that the general pattern I found with salvia is it helps you feel more connected to yourself and this reality. Hmm. Which is interesting because yeah. the questions I have later is about the weird reality <laughs> that yeah, people can find. Right. Um, so, I, you know, this is great. You, there's a lot of beautiful like tidbits of wisdom and experience and, and just generally juicy knowledge coming out of here. And I also notice that we're kind of jumping around a bunch like uh, yeah. uh, around. The, is there any closing um, things that you want to say about the therapy before I start asking you um a little bit more about the content of the experiences, like any other benefits uh, you want to talk about, any other, um, you know, maybe you want to further expand on why you choose the, you know, like the more moderate dosing, maybe further expand on, on what the regimen is. I'd be curious, like how oh, often right, yeah. with, with people, to what degree, you know, when is it time to stop? Um, and even how that compares to other therapies, psychedelic therapies. I mean, that's a lot of questions, but you know, right. really sift out what's relevant for you here. Sure, sure. Yeah, so again, as far as the regimen is concerned, um, usually I like to do um, three or four sessions with someone uh, once one week apart from each other. And during those four sessions, we help gather information about what the proper dosage is for them and also help to understand what they personally want to get out of salvia. Again, because it's such a versatile plant that has so many um, healings to offer, mm -hmm. um, it can be catered very directly to what people want. And then ongoing, um, then usually people see me maybe once a month or twice a month. Um, and then as far as the 
the dosage is concerned, by then they've learned what, what the proper dosage is. Um, and there was another question you had, oh, why might compare salvia therapy to, say, other uh, psychedelic therapies? Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things that I've noticed is, let's say comparing, um, we've already spoken about how salvia therapy can be sort of like ketamine therapy in a way, as mm-hmm. far as the fact that it arrests depression in its tracks. But another thing that's very useful about it is when you need to um, revisit and understand something traumatic that happened to you in your past, I'm going to compare it to MDMA therapy. Mm-hmm. When you have um, a difficult life situation that you went through that you've been unable to naturally integrate and work through, and when you do MDMA, you can revisit that situation again and look at it from a place of loving kindness and acceptance. So even though you went through something horrible, it's viewed through, you know, rose-tinted glasses in a way. And by viewing it in rose-tinted glasses, what it does is it then lets you have a new experience of what you previously had. Mm. And so it provides that missing experience for someone. So it, by looking at something through the emotional feeling of empathy and love and connection, that changes it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now with Salvia, funnily enough, Salvia seems to be quite an emotionless experience in some regards. Mm. And which, funnily enough, has its own very strong benefits because it takes the emotion away of an, of an experience. Let's say there's something that you feel uh, kind of fired up about or you feel emotionally unstable about. You can smoke the salvia and what it does is it takes the emotion away and just presents you with the bare bone facts and just being presented with the bare bone facts without the emotionally charged aspect of it helps you get a lot of clarity. Mm. And then, funnily enough, and almost paradoxically, being able to go through that situation again uh, without the emotion there helps you feel okay about it when you come back to normal, regular, non salvia reality. Like, like, uh, it's, it's almost like it just, um, sort of, uh, lessens, lessens the, um, lessens the threat response to the memory, uh, and gives you the memory without the, uh, extreme emotional, um, you know, bewilderment that arises in the present moment in the body and in the mind when the memory surfaces. Right. And also what it does is it says like, Hey, yes, this happened. It was shitty at the time, but these are the facts and let's help you understand it and this is what you learn from the experience from this that's what she does as well that's very very good um she she gives she's very good at helping you understand what you learned from a difficult situation in your life Mm. Mm. so takes the emotion away and says all right let's get rid of these emotions because they're not really helping you right now they're just getting in the way and this is what happened and this is what you learned Okay, you you get it, you understand? Good, now we can move on. Now you can take those lessons that you learned from the difficult experience. Now you've got a bigger tool set to work with. You can integrate them into your life going forward, but there's no need for you to keep spinning your wheels about it. Hmm, interesting. And so where does where does that sit inside of your uh, of your training as a as a somatic psychotherapist? So well in in quite a few aspects. So a big thing when people are um, reliving traumatic events is they hold the tension in their body. And it's not just tension in their body, it's they're holding it in how they present their body to you as well. Mm-hmm. And I've found in the clients that I've worked with that have I've helped them um, through questioning during salvia get to a place of understanding with, with a traumatic event um, you can just see their entire body like relax or their face lights up. Mm-hmm. And then the next week they just, they're holding themselves differently. For example, their shoulders might not be as tight. Like if you, um, if you feel like there's the weight of the world on your shoulders and everything has to do it, you can see how someone embodies that sometimes by having like a little bit of rigidity in a certain posture. It's like, yeah. it's keeping up and holding back feeling. But I've noticed that when people have had healing salvia experiences, the next week they come to me and they just don't have that feeling of, oh my gosh, I have to 
contain everything because if I don't contain everything, it's all going to be over. Mm. So that that's because in somatic psychotherapy, the reason why we we em, embody the uh, structures that we hold in our body is because we think I have to be like this because if I don't be like this, it was initially a defense mechanism. Right, right. If, I, if I'm not like this, if I don't sit like this, and it's all unconscious, yeah. but you're thinking, if I'm not, if my my fists aren't like this, then if I, I can't just be relaxed because there's no time to be relaxed because I'm the one who has to take care, to take care of everything. Right, or, or something along the lines of like, if I don't, if I'm not prepared for the danger that's always there, then that danger will right. hurt me. Even if right. that danger is not always there, it's like the body is like, no, 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 that danger is always there. I must always be hyper vigilant to protect right. myself. Exactly, and the, the fact of the matter is that oftentimes that danger is not there. Yes, there are people who have gone through very dangerous things, and there's a reason that they are feeling that the way that they're feeling. You know, so you, you never want to dismiss or minimize what someone's feeling. Mm -hmm. But um, if there's no danger there and you're constantly scanning the room and looking around all the time, it's absolutely exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a realization that when you come to an understanding that you scanning the room actually won't keep the danger out or you scanning the room doesn't have to be done, once you can stop doing that, it frees up so much more energy in your body mm -hmm. to where you can then actually channel it towards other creative endeavors in your life and you can just have more of your old self back right right and, th and this 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 is huge i mean like we certainly have not exhausted a description of what tra how trauma manifests in the body i mean we haven't talked about the difference between developmental or shock trauma or mm -hmm. what have you so that i, I think it's clear for pe i want to be clear for people listening if they haven't explored this topic at all that that is, you know, what we just talked about is accurate, but it's also not the complete picture of, of how exactly. trauma manifests or something. Right, um, right. So it, it, did you want to finish your line of thinking on, on the salvia trauma thing, or do you feel ready to move on? Um, no, I feel ready to move on. All right. I, I think I hit the points I could. Great, great, great. So um, I, before we get into, you know, what the hell is up with the crazy reality that salvia can take us to uh what is your administration when i saw you give this presentation i don't know if mm -hmm. you patent it or what but you had mm -hmm. developed a technology um, yeah. for administering uh salvia can you yes. talk about the salvia pipe i would love to talk about the salvia pipe and i can actually i have one right here because i made it so this here is the salvia pipe so the way it works is um, there's five bowls, and this is what I use when I do um, therapy with my clients is you load a small pinch of salvia in each bowl, mm -hmm. and there's a carb uh, there's a carb on the side over there. And so carb like a what do you mean by a carb yeah. like a choke? Oh, like, yeah. So like an, yeah. A, 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 an, an air control air intake control. Air intake control, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you see there's um, an air intake control over there, mm -hmm. and then there's an arrow over there. Mm -hmm. And so you, you close the air intake control, and it's a water pipe. So here's the downstem, so you fill it up with water. And then you would smoke that bowl, and then wait a couple minutes for the effects to take place. So when I'm doing it with, with clients, I load literally just a few flakes of salvia extract, if I am using extract. Mm -hmm. If I'm using plain leaf, it's just a small pinch. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you're done with that bowl, what you do is you pick this bowl part up here and rotate it and plop it back down and you move on to the next bowl. Mm -hmm. So you preload all your bowls and then you can just work through them like that. And then, and, and then the, the methodology you have is that like there's there's like a there's a step there's like a ladder that you're that you climb right can you just can you describe and then for people who are listening obviously you want to see this in video to know what the hell uh, Christopher is talking about here yeah. or um, you can or you can see it on salviapipe.com yeah and I'll make sure that link and a picture of the pipe are available at jamesdebjesso.com for the show notes to this episode continue please Christopher yeah so by 
using the pipe and incrementally taking yourself step by step into salvia space. Um, there was a graph that when I was lecturing at the um, um, Spirit Plan Medicine Conference, um, it was um, a graph of zero through 10. And I showed usually when people smoke a big bowl of the extract, there's a strong spike. So you go from zero to 10 in about 30 seconds and then you come crashing back down. But using the salvia pipe, what you can do is you can take one um, small inhalation of salvia, hold your breath for as long as possible, and that'll take you to level, say, one or two. Mm -hmm. And at that level, that's very good for um, getting to a state of calm relaxation. You'll feel your you begin to focus on your breath a whole lot more. Um, and you'll start to maybe feel some slight tingling sensations all over your body. And if you want to stop right there, you know, again, that's what I'd call the microdose, mm -hmm. if you were to think about it that way. If you want to stop right there, then you can stop right there. Um, but oftentimes, um, because you've, because you're slowly and safely working yourself into the salvia realm, your curiosity does get peaked and you think, well, let me have the next little bowl and see where that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing about that is that's safe to do because if you accurately load the bowls, you can load, smoke the next bowl and pretty much know that you're only going to be then taken to level like three or four. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of the trepidation away from the experience, and that's very psychologically help, helpful. Mm -hmm. So level you know, three or four, then you get to a, a lot deeper state of meditation. You'll start to feel more pulling and pushing forces on your body. People talk about it as like salvia gravity. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll feel their body kind of start to like move in a certain direction. Um, and that's good for setting an intention as well for like finding out questions or answers for questions that you have. Mm -hmm. So I'll take, you know, two or three hits. That's a good place to do body work as well um, to find out you know, you're like, oh, well, why am I having this problem with this person in my life, for example? What are the reasons for that? And then you can, Salvia can help you figure out why you're having interpersonal problems or if you want to make any sort of decisions in your life. And then after that, if you're still curious and going a little bit deeper, you can swivel the pipe around and move on to the next bowl. And the one thing that's nice about this is you don't have to reload bowls in between each successive inhalation, which makes a world of difference because I don't know if, you, if you've ever tried reloading bowls while you're losing touch with reality, it becomes difficult and um, it also becomes unsafe because you can no longer, no, no longer accurately gauge how much you're loading. Yeah, I can personally relate to that exact <laughs> consequence. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you think you're taking a small pinch, but you're taking a big old chunk of it and then yeah, then it's like, whoops, I've taken way too much. Right, right. But like that sixty-second salvia story I told you at that at that party yeah. in Vancouver, where you know I, I I came to in the middle of like the second massive bowl in my bong, being like, where am I? What am I doing? Oh my god, I'm smoking salvia. Back on track. Uh, so so you had just been describing you know the the efficacy of of the salvia pipe um, and why it's a good idea, um, and you were you were just getting into you know after you smoke the third bowl, you get to levels, you know whatever I assume five or six, uh, right? And then what that can do and what that's good for, right? So once you get to those higher levels. It then things can get a little bit uh, strange to the point where you feel as if you're getting taken. Either you feel like you're getting taken to this other place that some people refer to as salvia land. Um, it can either feel like you're being taken there or you feel like salvia land is coming to you where your environment changes and this other reality just starts to seep into your reality. And it's at these higher levels that you start to feel the presence of entities or other beings that seemingly have their own autonomous existence and have their own agency in life. And you can feel as um, if you are literally being taken to this other place. And once you learn how to um, feel comfortable in that space, you can actually begin to 
to commune with the entities or they'll commune with you. And what I've noticed is it's kind of up to them whether they make interaction with you or not. Um, it's, it's a little bit more difficult sometimes. To, if there's an entity and you just see it kind of standing there um, and it's not paying attention to you, you can't answer, hey, you over there, can you come and talk to me? Mm-hmm. That, this has just been mine and the clients I work with as well. The experience when they get to a state where they meet entities, um, they, they can't have direct communication with an entity that's not already engaging with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, for example, <clears throat> I was working with someone recently and he got taken to Salvia Land and he saw three farmers and and he'd never had an entity meeting before and i didn't tell him anything about the types of entities that he could meet in salvia land but they very are often they're farmers or blacksmiths or school teachers um it's funny these entities or their children these entities seem to have jobs and roles and personalities of their own hmm. and um so he saw three farmers but the three farmers had their backs turned to him so they were looking elsewhere so they didn't really notice him there so it's been my experience that let's say you were to see three farmers and they were to have their backs turned to you, you couldn't like tap their shoulders and say, hey, can you guys talk to me? Mm-hmm. But sometimes when you get taken to Salvia land, there is an entity that just comes up to you or it's just sitting there and it notices you're there and it starts communing with you. And when that happens, you can actually get into a, a thought conversation back and forth because the higher you go in salvia space, your language abilities get um, remarkably diminished. Yeah. And which is actually very useful for getting more understanding of things that are going on sometimes because language is pretty narrowing and finite. But in salvia space, you're communicating with yourself and you're communicating with these entities around you empathetically, telepathically, emotionally. Um, so you can get a much richer form of communication, but it gets, it gets a little bit difficult to um, put words to it. Mm-hmm. That's also when I'm guiding people on therapy sessions. That's part of the therapy aspect that I do as well. I help them put words to the experiences that they've had yeah, that they're having trouble finding it. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, sort of like dream interpretation in a way. Mm-hmm. So now we're at, you know, that's that's third pipe level um five six what mm-hmm. about what about level six seven or se- seven seven eight nine ten what about the fourth right. and fifth pipe where, where are these taking you so those take one to if you think about it you can kind of think about it in bands so the first band of experience is salvia takes you to your body and salvia takes you to your immediate surrounding in a very comfortable, caring, nurturing way. Mm-hmm. The next band is you can go to salvia space. You go to this land. And then the third band above that is you get taken past salvia land. There's, there's stuff beyond salvia land. And past salvia land is where you become um, inanimate objects, Um, it's very common to become a wheel or a cog in a machine. It's almost like Salvia Land was being created, and this reality as well was being created by some mechanism and some machine and some code that's running in the background. Hmm. So it seems as if this reality is just a thin veneer, but behind that is salvia land, which is a thicker veneer, but still behind that is the actual code and the construction of the ones and zeros and the cogs and the mechanisms that make this universe an actual existing thing. Hmm. And so when you get taken to that space, um, it can be terrifying. Well, I'll put it to you this way. It is terrifying if you smoke a big bowl of salvia and you jump straight from before or band one to band three. Hmm. But if you slowly, incrementally work yourself into salvia space and you transition through each band sequentially, by the time you get to the one where you're in an inanimate object or you are a thought-free 
pure conscious being in existence, it's not really scary because you've primed yourself psychologically and you've also primed yourself somatically. It's I, I call it somatic priming. Mm-hmm where you you prime your body for the physiological state of what it feels like to be in these much higher dimensions. Hmm. And if you slowly work yourself into that space, it's comfortable once you get there. Hmm. But if you just jump straight in, it's really unpleasant. It's kind of like if you get into a really hot, hot tub, it's much better if you just slowly ease yourself into that really hot water. Then it's manageable versus just jumping in. Hmm, interesting. I'm wondering now if you can maybe unpack some of what you see as as you know what's what's happening there. You know, like you you talk yeah. about being able to interpret, uh, or part of your therapy is to help people make sense of what they're going through, and yet there are these common threads of experience. Somebody um, I asked on my on the subreddit for for the podcast, the At Mind Podcast subreddit. Um, you know, I'm going to interview this guy on salvia therapy. You got any questions, right? Mm-hmm. And okay. um, one of the questions came up was to unpack some of these these archetypes. And I was directed to this, I don't know if you've seen it, but a, a fairly recent YouTube video of a, of a young guy talking about the different archetypes of the of mm-hmm. the salvia experience. He talked about flying, zippers, the circus, mm-hmm. um, the factory or warehouse, the jester, the clown. Um, oh great! And I'm and I'm curious. Uh, I'll, I'll I can send you. I'll send you the link, and I'll I'll include the video here because it's it's an interesting video. Or by here, I mean in the links to mm-hmm. it, within the show notes to this episode. Well, spaced out there. Uh, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Like, um, w- well, I'll just mention a couple things, and you let me know if we were in a session and I know there's no hard and fast rules. So maybe just make it up in a general way. If we were in a session and I said that I had the experience of, of like my body being zipped open or seeing people with zipper heads, what about the zipper? What, what would you interpret that as being all about? Right, right. So the one thing is I would take the zipper as a sign that you are in a certain depth. So I'd use that to gauge the depth that you're in. Um, I would also, you know, like to find out what it felt like for you to be unzipped. Was it uncomfortable or was it pleasurable? Uh, Where on your body were you being unzipped? Were you being unzipped straight up and down in your midline or were you being unzipped up and down your arms? And depending on where the zipping is, that is usually a sign for where there's some sort of energetic holding in your body that might Mm. need to be dealt with. Mm. Um, it's, It's Salvia's way of you know, eluding, like uh, pointing you out. I was like, hey, this is something that you should pay attention to over here. Hmm. Um, so it's more, what's more important is what was it like for you to become unzipped? What did it feel like for you when you're being unzipped? Was there absolutely no emotion involved in it? And it was just plain, oh yeah, I'm being unzipped. Or when you're being unzipped, did it trigger any sort of memories that were maybe that you hadn't thought about for a long time. Hmm. Um, when you, after you got unzipped, did it feel like the zippers vanished and went away in a certain direction or did the zipper like stay right there behind you? It's a little bit like detective work. You know, you, you, yeah, yeah. you, you have to say, um, what was behind the zipper? You know, when you were unzipped, what, what was inside of you? What was there? Was there nothing there? Was there a colorful landscape? Um, did you think you were going to die? Would, did you did you feel like you wanted to zip yourself back up again? Right, right. And yeah. then I guess that the, that line of inquiry um, is something that you could apply to any any of the other manifestations. The you know how did you feel when you were in the factory or when you started flying right. or how, so, how how did you feel when you saw other people being unzipped like this sounds very similar to how my work with psilocybin mushrooms that i've been putting out over the last few years that's my big um suggestion is not to be like you know what did uh you know what did my encounter with aliens mean what were they trying to tell me right. so much as well how did you feel in that mm-hmm. moment? what feelings were present how was that relevant exactly. to you you know, and right. try to track where the relevancy is and sort of weave it into, you know, a coherent narrative that directly involves your lived life as the, as the non-psychedelically enhanced sense of self. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. And so, 
with the wheel, for example, when people tell me that they feel like a wheel or they become a wheel, then I'm like, okay, great, they're a wheel. So I know what to do here. So one thing that one should do when it becomes a wheel is go with the feeling of becoming a wheel instead of trying to stop the wheel or instead of trying to go in a reverse direction of the wheel. Hmm. And by go with it, I mean... Um, hmm. When you get to the higher states of salvia and you feel that feeling of motion, you can actually, that feeling of motion feels so real, but that feeling of motion is also connected to your thoughts. Hmm. And so what I've learned that what you can do is, let's say you're the wheel and you feel like you're spinning counterclockwise. Focus all your attention on that feeling of spinning counterclockwise. And imagine using your imagination and using your creative visualization, try and make that feeling go even more counterclockwise. So really like use your imagination to take yourself more in the direction that Salvia is taking you. Mm -hmm. Because it, it sounds funny, but Salvia is moving you in those directions for a specific reason. It's her way of energetically rebalancing your body. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You move in a certain direction and as you're moving in that certain direction once you've done a few rotations of the wheel then i've come to find that once you surrendered into that then you can have a little bit more agency over either which way the wheel turns or if you don't want it to be a wheel anymore and you want to change it to a different feeling or let's say you feel like you're being pushed to the right let yourself be pushed to the right uh, using your um, again using your imagination and, and using your thoughts um, make yourself try go more right I mean keep your body stationary but make your thoughts go along with the feeling that Salvia is pushing you mm -hmm. and then once you've gotten into her groove then you can kind of get into your own groove together and then it becomes more like a dance mm. so in, instead of feeling like you're just being thrown around like a rag doll you can actually um, work with it. But first, you kind of got to give her the benefit of the doubt and, and let her know that she, she's moving you in the way that you need to be moved right then. Hmm. So then how would, you, how, would you, how would you show up to somebody who said, who's saying something along, if they're managing to make words like, I, I'm a chair, you know, or right. I, I, am, I, am, I am just a, I'm in a machine, right? When, when they get to that place, as I know some people I've heard talk about, you know, they... It's like they have the experience of, of waking up um, and realizing they had been a chair their whole life um, right. and, and that they were just dreaming of being a human or something. like. How, how about situations like that? So it also depends on how they feel about being a machine or being a chair. Um, if, if someone has usually – and it, it's – I haven't had too many clients that I take to the place of them becoming a machine mm -hmm. um, because, again, I, all, a lot of the therapeutic benefits I happen are in the levels before that. Um, but even the way you said, I'm a machine, you, you said it as if you were speaking for someone else, but there was a little bit of panic in your voice and mm -hmm. there was like a, mm -hmm. oh, fuck, I'm a machine. Right, right. But if you... Because when I work with clients and if I do take them to that space, because I've done it in a safe container slowly, gradually over time, when they come to the place where they're, they're a machine, instead of them saying, I'm a machine, they say, I'm a machine. <laughs> right, and, right. And We're it, curious. Yeah, like, wow, how about that? I'm a machine. And that's a very important distinguishing factor with how to get benefits or understanding from these, from these states of being, treating it with just an odd curiosity instead of a feeling of like, oh my God, I'm always going to be a machine and I really miss my human body because that was much nicer than being a machine. Mm. So, um, so that's one aspect, treating it with curiosity. And when you do get to that state, it's be like, wow, I'm a machine. And then you can go down lines of inquiry about, um, do you, you know, do you feel like you're being used by other people in your life? This you know, is during or afterwards? That's afterwards. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, it's like when you were a machine or when you became the chair, 
um, usually when I work people into the state where they, if they do become like the lazy boy that they're sitting on, it's they're going to less feel like that they are the chair and they're going to feel more like they are a part of the chair, but it's really nothing more than just a very, very comfortable, deep-rooted feeling of security and safety. Hmm. Kind of like if they were like, if the chair was initially like wet concrete and they kind of sat in it and sunk down a little bit and then it hardened around on them, um, that feeling of security and solidity and being locked in to the object you're, that you're sitting on, um, I find as well helps people get a strong sense of grounding within themselves and a sense of resolve and a sense that they can be strong in the, in the face of adversity. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. But, yeah. So, um, but, go, please continue. Oh, I was going to say, but if you just immediately become a chair, from being human to chair with no spaces in between, then then fear kicks in and you can't learn anything in a state of fear. Right, right. Yeah. Um, or, or possibly the things that you learn are, are not advantageous learnings um, right. as, yeah. as, as they might arise as a, as a type of psychedelically induced trauma. Right. Um, so, you know, in, in favor of time, because I feel like you're, you've got a wealth of uh, a wealth of stuff going on there. And I, I suppose it's better to leave people wanting more than to get, get tired <laughs> in the conversation. Plus we've been running for a long time, which is amazing. I just have two mm. more, two more questions and we'll, I'll be sure to make, to get, you know, where people can learn more about your work or get in contact with you. Sure. The second last question has to do with themes as well. Earlier you talked mm-hmm. about spirit entities and the salvia land, uh, that there's a common experience of sort of coming to in this other realm. Some people say it's like the realm of the dead or, and it there's inhabitants there that, like you said, are going about their own life. It just mm-hmm. seems as though, you know, this, it's just, you know, if I showed up and if I took a flight to Paris and I got, you know, I'm in Paris and here's all these people, they're doing their own thing. They're speaking a different language. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, whatever, until mm-hmm. they realize I'm the English speaker. Maybe they, I'm mm-hmm. not really interesting to them whatsoever. They're just going about their own world. Um, and that uh, the people who have these experiences say that they feel more real than real. And right. sometimes, again, sort of like with the chair example, they'll have they'll have an experience where they come to, and there there'll be entities there, and and they are engaging them, and they and they they're like, oh, you're back, you know, like what did you learn? What right. do you have for us? Or they have this sensation of, of they come to, and that they felt like their life as a human was a dream, mm. and that they you know right. they're actually a member of this realm. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about this experience and. Yeah. And the actual like the the reality of these experiences are these just metaphorical or is Salvia accessing us to a realm or a dimension that's beyond the individual mind? Right, right. So the value of these experiences I find when you have this experience of like oh I thought I was a human on earth but I'm actually a being in this space. Mm. Um and then you kind of come back to earth very quickly and you think, wow, that was a very short but real temporary experience. That exact same thing applies to us here on Earth as well. Mm -hmm. Us being here on Earth is just a very short but temporary illusion that seems very real right now. Mm -hmm. But once we're dead, I assume we'll be like, wow, that seems so real. It was just a trip. Mm -hmm. And here I am now in this other next place that I'm gonna be at for who knows how long and now this is my next new reality. So I've noticed that what that's personally helped me with and helped some of the people that I've worked with is when they get shown the temporary nature of salvia space, then they realize, wow, this is a life here on earth is also very similarly temporary. Like right now, me talking to you seems very, very real because you know, it is to us. Right, yeah. Um, but I also know that it's just... It feels no less real than when I feel the reality of salvia space. Hmm. And there's, for me, there's something about the um, the brevity of it all that makes it seem less life seem less heavy. Hmm. It makes it seem more like a fun, adventurous game. And um, 
you know, like there was this time when I was in Salvia space and these, um, I think I mentioned it during my, in the conference that, um, these two little girls ran up to me excitedly and they said, Oh, you're back. You're back. What was it like? What was it like? And they meant, you know, what was it like when you were alive on live on earth? Hmm. And, and then they wanted to know what adventures I got into and what stories I had for them. You know, it was kind of like someone coming back from a, the war, you know, in a small sleepy town. And then the, the kids gathering around the person, finding out the stories that they got into while they were deployed. But um, in this instance, it wasn't, oh, you went to war. But in this instance, it was, wow, you went on a really big, fun adventure where you had a body and you could interact with people with this funny stuff called language. And you had these emotions that were very human and unlike the emotions we have here. So it was just like, wow, that was a completely different experience for you. What was it like? And so that's really helped me just feel, I guess I can say this, there's, there's one lesson that Salvia gave me one time when I was in, in Salvia reality and um, I was, you know, reminiscing about my time back on earth because it had seemed like I, it had been a long time since I've been alive on earth. And um, right as I knew I was going to be going back to earth, um, Salvia said to me, um, you know, there's something important I want to tell you, and that is that there's only one rule to live by. And that is that every day you get to go out and play on this earth, and the one rule is that you just have to play nice with others. And Salvia very often has this theme of play. Hmm. It's um, like life is play, fun is play. Like, yeah, even if like hard and shitty things happen, that's part of the game too. Mm. So she really helps when treating everything with a sense of levity. Mm. Now to your question of, you know, how real is it? You know, is it is it only a metaphor? Um, the one thing that I find fascinating is that people have such similar experiences on Salvia, even if they know absolutely nothing about it. Um, you, you can take many people who have heard nothing about Salvia take them to Salvia land, and they'll run into the same sorts of themes, mm. like these archetypes. They'll run into like a book, or a schoolhouse, or a carnival, or a parade, or um, field workers. Um, so that just makes me think, you know, where where is it in our brain and our consciousness I just don't know, because why, when we get our kappa opioid receptors activated by this plant, do, with no prior knowledge of it, have an understanding of the archetype of a school hmm. or a wheel? And they're, they're all very, very similar. So that kind of makes me think that it is some higher dimension that we really are accessing, hmm. and we really are perceiving it. Because otherwise, we'd all view different things every single time. Mm. But it's the remarkable similarity between journeys and between people's experiences that really make me think, hey, this actually might be something, that, that this might be a realm that we are experiencing that we, we're privy to mm. when we're on Salvia. Mm. All right. Well, big big metaphysical claims being made right there. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so let's, the final question I think is, uh, is one that, you know, we, we, we skirted around and it's that Salvia can actually really mess a person's head up if they, you know, jump mm -hmm. from a first band to the third band or, you know, just decide to smoke some 400 extract in a big bong or something. And it, it can cause very adverse reactions. Um, what are your suggestions? I mean, the, the suggestions f for uh, avoiding it, avoiding that seem clear, have a clear intention, go slow, you know, maybe have a, have a sitter with you, don't mm -hmm. smoke a big load of 400X, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. Um, Meditate beforehand. Yeah, so so that's sort of some of the common themes that you would have for any responsible use of any type of, of psychedelic. But right. what are your suggestions for supporting people who are recovering um, from frightening experiences with with salvia how would if someone came to you and said you know this is the experience i had 
and it shook me and I, it still shakes me and I, you know, I'm confused or upset and, and it had like a long, a long lasting negative reaction. How would you support yeah. people in that? What advice would you give to people who are listening, who might've had their, you know, Miley Cyrus YouTube video equivalent um, right. of, of their experience? Um, and what would you suggest for them to, to helping recover? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a huge question to answer. Like, how do you have someone recover from a traumatic psychedelic experience? Um, but I would say if they're, if they're having trouble that's affecting their life to the point where they really are shaken up and they don't really know what to do, um, I'd suggest not throwing more drugs at it. Don't think, oh, well, maybe, maybe if I do ayahuasca, it'll help me. Mm -hmm. It might. But first, see what you can do by talking to you know a trained professional who knows what they're what they're doing. When you, you want to talk to a therapist who knows how to work with these states, not someone who's going to um, categorize you and say, "Oh, you had a schizophrenic psychotic episode, and you just broke your brain, and right, here's right. Some medication." You know, don't do that. Here's some haloperidol um, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's some Xanax just to take the edge off. Right. Um, no, so you don't want to do that. You generally don't want to throw more drugs at it. You first, if before you do try explore those realms again, um, you want to get to a healthy, normal baseline. So very simple things such as having a very healthy, and it sounds simple, but it really works, a healthy diet, um, fresh fruits, fresh grains, whole grains, fruit like vegetables, like healthy fish, um, exercising, um, getting a strong meditation practice as well consistently. Meditate every day consistently for at least 20 minutes, say, can help you with those um, feelings of anxiety or angst. Um, and again, also talking to someone about what exactly was it that was terrifying about the experience. Mm -hmm. um, what beliefs do you now have that you didn't have before you had this experience? Do you feel like everything is meaningless? Do you feel like you're unable to connect with people in the same way that you could before? Because when you have these big breaks that happen within you, oftentimes it can lead to a loss of connection with your sense of self and your own identity. Mm -hmm. And that's that loss of connection with your sense of self and your own identity, which then makes it feel as if you can't connect with the world around you. So whatever practice you can do to help you get in touch with who you are at your core, um, and it might mean creating a new identity or persona. Now, that can be quite scary. Let's say you've spent you know, a good portion of your life building up your identity and then you have a profound psychedelic experience that shatters your identity, and you think, oh no, I have no identity, I'm nothing, I'm just gonna be like aimlessly floating through this earth with no point of our existence. You know, that's looking at it from a very fear-based approach. But you could actually look at it from another angle, which is that this could be a really amazing, beautiful opportunity for you to recreate yourself in a way that is full of integrity, that is full of joy, that is meaning that you create for yourself, mm -hmm. not meaning that you're as ascribing to your life from society and your peers and these weird social norms that we have. Right. So the, the detrimental ones anyways. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still have to be able to live within some, some social norms, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah, that doesn't mean just become an all-out anarchist and start doing whatever the no hell pants, you want. No pants, no pants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have no identity, no pants, no identity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's an amazing opportunity to really be able to, with integrity and with mindfulness, kind of start from a blank slate and then build yourself up to, you know, it might take a lot of work, it might take a lot of support from your friends who understand you. Um, but once you've gotten to a good, healthy baseline again, maybe it's best if you never do these things ever again. Hmm. Um, that's just the case for some people. Yeah. Maybe if you do do it again, start with a really, really tiny dose and see how that sits with you. Maybe if you want to get into it again, try microdosing. 
try to take one teeny hit. Um, but you need to do it with respect and with care because you've already learned something about yourself. You've learned that the previous state you were in wasn't um, able to yet handle these big spiritual emergencies that happen on these substances. Hmm. And so um, that's what my advice would be. Hmm. So let's, hmm. let's th thank you for that, Christopher. Let's, let's um, draw to a close. And in that closing, I, I want to get your social media handles where people can find you know, out about more of your work, maybe where they could get a salvia pipe. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe you could start by answering this simple question, which is, do you provide integration services or coaching for people who might be in the very state that you just spoke about and are looking for an informed person to talk to, such as yourself? Um, and if mm -hmm. so, how can they contact you in that regard? Yeah, you can contact me at, um, so my email address is Christopher at salviahealings.com, S-A-L-V-I-A-H-E-A-L-I-N-G-S.com. And um, I do phone consultations or Skype consultations. And um, the salvia pipe can be gotten at salviapipe.com. And my website is salviahealings.com. And you can find me on Facebook as well, Christopher Solomon. And I live in San Francisco. And my profile picture is of me hugging a goat. <laughs> yeah, it's, a great, it's a great photo. Yeah, yeah it's a great goat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't use Twitter or anything like that, but th those are the main ways that people can get in touch with me. Great. Well, I will be sure that uh, all of those links and uh, your email address and contained to the show notes in the show notes of this episode, which are always at jameswgesso.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Christopher, thank you very much for your time today and all the wonderful knowledge that you offered uh, to the Adventures Through the Mind community. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been really great. I really appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, cheers. And, and, and ditto. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and cut. I hope that you enjoyed that interview as much as I enjoyed having the conversation. If you did enjoy it, of course, you can share it with a friend, um, either on the internet or word of mouth, or directly like put it on an MP3 stick and slip it into their pocket when they're not looking with a little note on it saying, listen to this podcast. It's really good. I really want you to enjoy it with me. And then we can have conversations about it or whatever. I mean, that's a lot to write on an MP3 stick, but sharing and engaging, uh, come on over to the subreddit. That would be great. Or at mine podcast or in a more immediate uh, and directly financial way of supporting the show would be Patreon, uh, donation through PayPal or crypto, or buying something off the Adventures to the Mind store, all of which you can find at jamesabugesso.com forward slash support, which is linked in the description to this podcast wherever you are listening to it. Thank you very much, and I will see you in two weeks for the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Thanks a lot. Take care.